Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Building the Black Educated Pipeline podcast. I am your host, Shana Terrell, educated activist dedicated to the lifelong struggle of freedom and liberation for her people. Um, Greetings, everybody, and welcome back. You guys know by now, you should know by now that we are an official podcast, y'all. So remember to like, to share, tell a friend, to tell a friend. You can find us on all major networks, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you like to get your daily podcast, please get us. Again, tell a friend to tell a friend, because this is the place where we come to talk to real educators doing the real work in the real struggle. And shout out to Bright Beam and the Center for Black Educated Development for giving us this platform. So today's show theme is building a Black educator pipeline and the reality. Today, we'll be discussing edu- how education is indoctrination. And joining us today, of course, is my Baba, Dr. Greg Carr, Associate Professor at Howard University, host of In Class with Carr, host of the Black Pig Table, and also check out the K Narratives. Um, but he's going to join us today to talk about our system of education and how it functions as indoctrination for all of our citizens. We'll explore the current state of the world <laughs> and how education or lack thereof uh, plays a role in today's current events. Let's get into it. What's up, Doc? Hey, what's going on? I'm Shana. Everything good? Everything is good. I mean, good in terms of like my personal, yes, you know, course. little box that I'm it's in. The first one. But in terms of the world, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> oh, we're if done. I'm we're finished. But I mean, other than that, <laughs> it's not a reason <laughs> oh to stop. I mean, the, the alternative is just to lay down. We're never going to do that. But we're never going to lay down. Yeah, the work at the center continues. Everything's going well, huh? Yeah, the work at the center is going really, really well. As you know, in about uh, two good weeks, we'll be launching our Freedom Schools Literacy yeah. Academy. Freedom so Summer. we'll be having some bright, young high school students and college students in front of us ready to work. Excellent. Um, That's excellent. And on top of that, we'll also have a nice group of master teachers coming in to show our young people the way, you know, getting in the midst of training our replacements. Oh, that's um, critical. Huh? So <laughs> glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. We'll be in the midst of that work in about two weeks, but life is good. Um, life is pretty good. Excellent. At the excellent. With excellent. The excellent. But doc, you know, we talk about the center, um, talk about the world and what we're doing out here. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I've pondered with, right, through all of the current events that's happening, and I'm pretty sure we'll talk about some specifically today, um, but it has made me really think about what is the purpose um, of education? Because I think education means different things to different people, especially meaning different things to different people depending on what country you're in. Um, but what do you think is the purpose of, of education? Well, I mean, I think it depends on what the, uh, well, Generally speaking, the purpose of education is for each generation to learn what is necessary to live. So in the most Mm. in the most broad sense, um, every living organism comes equipped to learn. Um, You know, some are more Mm. oriented to react more instinctually and others can acquire the capacity to to acquire information and to remember. And generally speaking, in terms of our species, human beings, as my old professor, Dr. Obinga, used to say, the capacity to remember, to reflect, and then to use experience, either direct experience or indirect, which is acquired, of course, by virtue of study, is, you know, the capacity to do that is what distinguishes human beings more than you know, from the other species. We can mm-hmm. remember. And, of course, in the purpose of education, then, would be shaped to the purpose of whatever society you find yourself in. And, yep. and so, I mean, it really comes down to a word that is often described as one of the most difficult words to define. And that is culture. You know, culture is what people do. Mm-hmm. So the question then becomes, well, how did you learn to do what you do? 
What are the protocols that you observe? What is the correct behavior in a specific situation? What should you aspire to? What should you desire? How do you curb your human desires and shape them to collective meaning and social purpose? All of that pours into the broad definition of education and then it's shaped to whatever society we find ourselves in. Mm, And you bring up great points in terms of culture, Mm -hmm. because the other thing I got to thinking is, right, you know, I am in America. This is where I live. Mm -hmm. But then I wonder, like, do you think that education is defined differently in different countries? So what we define as education, generally when people talk in frames in, in America about education, they're talking about school. They're talking about going to school. Most people don't have the conversation of education and what that really means outside of a school building. Right. Like how folks can actually educate themselves outside of going to school or you're receiving education where when you're in your home or there's a certain education that you receive even in your peer group with friends. Right. All of that are forms of education. But most people in America talk about education as confined to a school building and even extending out into, okay if you attend a university. Right. But those are really how people define education in America. And those are the conversations that people have around education in itself. Um, but do you think education is defined, or is it? Because I know you know, is defined differently in different countries. Yes, yeah. I mean, we definitely live in on part of the globe that is called the United States of America. But more importantly, we live on the earth. And mm-hmm. as we were talking before we went live, the United Nations has been sounding the alarm for many years about global warming and they released a series of reports just this year uh, in April, May. If you go to the UN website, UN News and go under climate and environment, hit that tab, they are sounding the alarm. I mean, this ball that we call Earth is resetting. It's going to purge itself of the species. Mm -hmm. So when we think then about where we live in terms of these artificial human creations we call countries or nations or states, how education is shaped in these individual countries tends to try to conform to what those countries see as their interests. And by those countries, I mean the governments of those countries. So when we start talking about formal education, if you were to compare, say, the concept of education as discussed and implemented among educational policymakers in, say, South Korea mm-hmm. or Burkina Faso or South Africa versus the United States of America, what you would see is there are going to be a lot of similarities. There will be uh, the directive to make sure that children have basic literacy so they are able to read and write in whatever the language, or in the case of South Africa, the language is, because there are many different languages that are official languages in South Africa. Uh, There is the directive that they have a basic competence in the ability to uh, calculate numeracy, we might call it, have math skills, uh, applied science skills, some basic introduction to biology and chemistry, those types of things. And then it gets interesting. First of all, that's never Uh, achieved because there will still be even with a directive that everybody should be able to read, write, do some basic figuring and have some basic skills. There's still going to be differences relative to where you are in the country, whether you have access to teachers, school building, these kind of things. But let's just stipulate that everybody gets the same basic education, or at least that's the aspiration. Then it gets interesting because then what you see is who in that society gets continued education will depend largely on the needs of that society. Mm-hmm. So do you, you You need a bureaucracy. You need a manager class. So who's going to go into public service? Uh, you need a class that is going to make the laws. and make, So who's going to continue so they can get a grasp of how the laws function in the society? Uh, who's going to go out and promote or propel the economy? Then it gets very interesting because uh, business tends to transcend the lines on the map. So a student, for example, in China, where they have an excellent public education system, have an excellent university system, secondary system, 
they may decide they want to travel. Where are you going? Well, I'm going to uh, the Wharton School in Philadelphia. Why? Because they have one of the best business schools. So I'm going to Stanford. Why are you going to the United States? Because I want to understand business principles as driven by the West. And that's finally when we get into the very interesting context of education or higher education, because that's being driven and still being driven by the system that has been set in place slowly over the last thousand years and really accelerated over the last 500 years that we might call the modern world system. And that's the capitalist system, Mm -hmm. where the basic principle of education that operates in a capitalist system is everybody doesn't need to develop their full human potential. What everybody needs to do is fit into this system that we have developed. So some people will never even glimpse the possibility of fulfilling their full human potential because the society they live in doesn't need them to. In fact, requires that they don't fulfill their human potential because if they did that, they may get restless and mess around and say, we need to rewrite the Constitution and uh, (laughs) I want $45 an hour. No, 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 no. (laughs) Teach them enough not to cut off their fingers in the machine to make sure they press the right button to give me my change or better in fact we're going to eliminate change just tap your plastic card or better yet just wave your hand on the because those people uh went to the advanced technology that we have available for them in another learning situation and this other person just supposed to deliver packages we we, we still haven't figured out the way to get drones completely so you work in the amazon factory and uh we'll make sure you get just enough education to do that so that's when it starts coming apart the, the economic mm-hmm. side really drives that kind of decision making Yes. And I always say that, like when you start to cross business with human function and mostly uh, where I see just just disappointing is like when you start to cross business and like student education. So business and kids, it's so problematic because business is always going to trump what the need of students are. Business is, is always going to trump what the needs of kids are. But you already hit the nail on the head when you said, why? Because we're not worried about kids and full potential in the life of what these babies can grow into. We're worried about what can you do for society? That's right. What can you do? Or, and or, 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 or what do we need you to do? And that do. we is very small. Yeah, that other idea, <laughs> it's very simple. It's just a three letter word. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> we want all kids. That's a lie. In fact, you you know, how many times have we said this, Shana, when we've had our talks? And I'll tell you, when I was working directly for the school district as an administrator, working every day for the school district of Philadelphia, and I would go into rooms and they have all this great curriculum work. They said, we want these kids. And I would just ask a very simple question. Do you have children? If they said yes, I said, is this what your children are doing? If they said no, I said, OK, it's time for me to lead this meeting. Because you ta- right. you're talking about other people's children. We know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And you gonna make decisions for other people's yeah, kids, yeah. and and feel like you don't have enough respect for parents to even invite them in the room to have a say. So no, and we don't have, uh, and policymakers don't have enough respect for parents to stop them. Mm-hmm. In fact, they're looking for a job as a consultant to go work for them to help them figure out <laughs> how they can put a little hip hop in it and maybe make the right color so they can so that the uh, poison can go down a little smoothly. And the crazy yes. thing is, the parents are paying for it because it's our tax dollars at work. Our tax money. <laughs> our tax money. I remember somebody looked at me so crazy one time when I said, "You know, I really want to get a lawsuit together to uh, sue the school district." And they're like, "Well, why?" I said, "Well, because me as a parent, right? If I have a kid." My tax dollars are paying for the school right up the street. Meaning if I lived in a suburban neighborhood, right, like there aren't any choices, right, of schools to go to. Like everybody goes to specific schools. So even when people start to talk about zoning, right, if I live in a suburban neighborhood, you're zoned to a school, right? That's Some right. of them only got two schools. That's so right. my kid has to go to very specific schools. Like it's no, we don't have any choices. But in the city, right, like if the school up the street for me sucks, <laughs> What other option do I have? But again, if I was in a restaurant paying for this, right, uh, if it's customer service, I wouldn't take this. Hey, you need to go and take this cold plate back or this food is subpar. I'm not paying for this. So how do you get to take? I'm a homeowner. right? How do you get to take my tax dollars every year and provide me with subpar service? And I'm supposed to have nothing to say about it. Nothing. <laughs> and my whole thing is if I don't or I have a right to refuse service, right? Yes. Like if I don't want to spend my money at a restaurant, I don't have to go there and eat there. So yes. how do you have the right to take my money when I could be using that money to go spend it at another establishment, right? Yes. Education. But yes. watch how to get a better quality of education if this is what you're telling me your level of service yes. is. Well, well, you know what's so funny you say that because there was a lawsuit in mm. Philadelphia. And the lawsuit, which was uh, an active lawsuit in the 1990s, accused the state of Pennsylvania of shorting the school children of 
Philadelphia around these very issues. And I'll never forget our first year of Philadelphia Freedom Schools as, a, as an entity was the summer of 1999. The superintendent of schools at the time, David Hornbeck, was a big supporter of Freedom Schools. That's why we had seven that year and then 14 in the year 2000. And he came to training and he, he was very, 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 very dedicated to addressing exactly what you just said with, 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 with a school district leadership that was equally addressed. I'll never forget June 2000. It'll be 22 years this summer, this June. He resigned. Why? Because the mayor of Philadelphia, who had won the previous year, John Street, made a deal with the governor of Philadelphia, at uh, governor of Pennsylvania at the time, Tom Ridge, to halt the lawsuit mm. so in exchange for the state of Pennsylvania stopping its threat to take over Philadelphia public schools. David Hornbeck said, nah, this is a lawsuit and we're going to win because you cheating these poor students, these black students, these brown students, and we're going to win. John Street sold the school district out, made a deal with the governor. David Hornbeck's like, word? I quit. Oh, Hornbeck resigned. So, I mean, it, the reason I sell that in terms of what is the purpose of education, the power of education, it seems to me, going back to what I said a minute ago, when human beings don't have a memory, then how do we distinguish between us and the other animals or the other living creatures that don't have a memory? People look at a goldfish and say, oh, that poor goldfish. That goldfish don't have no memory. Every time that goldfish swim around that bowl, they see that castle for the first time. Well, guess mm -hmm. what? Every time we raise an issue now, if we don't remember all the other times we raised it, it's as if we are raising it the first time. first time. And guess who has a long memory? The people who oppress us. They remember yep. that lawsuit. <laughs> they, but we, we say, okay, now we're going to create a new program. Every time somebody come with a new program, I just shake my head. You don't remember the last five times? What are the lessons we learned last time we did? Oh, 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 we did that before? Yeah, check, please. I'm going back over here and work with some people who have memory. Why? Because you cannot beat a system if you don't remember. And there was a lawsuit. And that lawsuit had a great chance at success, which is why he, Hornbeck was so furious. So anyway, I just thought that it's a lesson in education. It is. But I think it's also a great point that you make about memory. And I think yes. it, it harps us back to, like, when we talk about education, like in the way the public education system was set up in America, we have to explore what was that in response to? Why was this set up? It most certainly wasn't set up for memory purposes, right? So that folks can remember <laughs> and drive towards a better, a better situation like that. That definitely like, cause we see now what's going on. Like they're trying to erase, um, I try to stay away so much from this uh, CRT conversation, but it's really hard to because every everything that you're starting to see right now points to the signs of why. Number one, again, we've talked about this before. What they're fighting against is not CRT. CRT was never taught in K through 12 um, public education, education period. It mm -hmm. is it is a law theory. Um, and have these people who talk about it has never read um, Derek Bell's book. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't even know what CRT is is but what you're fighting against is your history of struggle and oppression right like that you don't want to talk about and it's really for white folks your history of oppression um your oppressive nature um in america and the history of that you don't want that to be talked about but why and you just drew that connection because the memory because if people remember <laughs> and people begin to see how over and over again through manipulation tactics and through more oppression and through systematized racism, like all this legalized racism and all of this, how you've been able to stop a movement and stop success and stop equality and equity or whatever names we want to call it, uh, people would be having a fit. And of course, everybody says, oh, you don't want your grandchildren to know who you really are. Of course they don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, nobody wants to see that. <laughs> no. Nope. No. Because nobody wants to face the truth and nobody wants to be accountable and take responsibility for the mess um, that we've made of this country, um, the yeah. mess that we've made of humanity. Yeah. Yeah. And and, um, and 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 even when we do want to take responsibility, we don't want it to be too painful. So I mean, we don't want to have to sacrifice ourselves. In, in the words that I overheard coming out of a meeting one time at the school district, I heard an administrator tell another administrator, a younger administrator who was deciding whether to uh, relocate inside Philadelphia. The older administrator 
who happened to be white, told the younger administrator, who happened to be white, uh, when asked about whether or not to put their children into public schools in Philadelphia. This is the district they get a paycheck from, mind you. I'll never forget. Um, the older person told the younger person, oh, you never sacrifice your own. Oh, so, so this is missionary work. I'm sorry. Aren't you getting paid every two weeks? <laughs> yeah. So you're a thief. <laughs> so anyway. So many thieves. Many thieves. Many crooks. Ma many crooks. In a schoolhouse. Yeah, but but, but well-meaning. But well-meaning. So well, tell by, me. Whose, by, whose def by whose definition? Well, but. By, by their concept. Well, this is the whole thing. This is by their concept of who they are and who we are. So mm. you're, you're absolutely right, of course. Critical race theory is not taught. At the same time, I embrace and welcome the racists, the white nationalists who say that people are teaching CRT because I know what they're scared of. What they really mean is actually very accurate. What they uh, are scared of is that the lie that they were told, that they were taught their whole lives is about to be destabilized. Mm -hmm. Now, they love black people as long as they are black people that fit the definition that they were taught and that's and that education isn't in school that education is in society mm -hmm. so they love Shaquille O'Neal here's a seven foot man who they would give their infants to and say ride her around on your shoulders they're not they're not terrified of that why because that's a, a an athlete he you, they, they would allow Rihanna you know to 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 cradle their child they I mean why because you're a singer yeah but then when Shannon Terrell shows up talking about education oh well, we got a problem here why because see <laughs> You're not you're not running. No, you're not singing. No, you're not doing a little nasty dance. No, what you're not butt naked on a video. And no. Yeah. So I can't watch you in three o'clock in the morning when my wife's going to sleep. No, I, no. Oh, well, then <laughs> oh, no. you're outside the definition. I don't want my children going to school learning about Harriet Tubman. No, no, I don't. Just, no. So what they're afraid of is very real. What they're afraid of is that their education is about to be upset. And this society is not going to be different until that education is upset. So they should be afraid. They should be very afraid. Because yes, it should be extremely afraid. Should, should be mean, extremely afraid. <laughs> well, my thing is like, be, be accepting of what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's just me, right? Go into it. Let the fear go. Be accepting of what's going to happen. And that is that black people are human. But, but people. what would they, what would they lose though, Shane? What would they lose if, if they were to do that? Everything. But in their minds, no, this is the point. The, the, one of the purposes of education is socialization. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you're poor, if you are housing insecure, if you don't have a job that pays you a living wage, then the things that might appear at first glance to be irrational, those are the things you hold on to. Hold the on most. to. And yep. wh whiteness is the thing that poor whites have to hold on to hold because on they don't to. have anything else. Nothing else. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Nothing else. Exactly. Yes. So for the perception in their mind, you're, you're, going to lose out on some type of social status because I can't even say social economic status because mm -mm. for some folks I mean whiteness don't even pay off for you economically nope. like it just doesn't no nope. you just literally you just out here white That's right what, like that, out here white <laughs> well and, and and so if you don't have anything you can always look at that picture of George Washington that's in your third grade textbook. And feel, and feel and pride. And feel pride. You can say, I'm Italian. You can see Christopher Columbus' name <laughs> in your high school. Te now, wait a minute. What, what you talking about Mali? What is Mali? What is Egypt? What, who is who is Madam C.J. Walker? No, damn it. I'm poor, but when I come to school, we wave that flag. We salute. We come from yes. officer so-and-so who I've never had to run from. In fact, that's my uncle. Comes to the school. Don't take that from me. Because as long mm -hmm. as that's there, I can delude myself into thinking that I can move up. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Then our, then our children are sitting there being told silently through those same images and narratives, you are in your place and you will remain there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, when we talk about education being created in this country, especially public education, and what that was really in response to, right? Like folks needed Certain people for certain jobs needed a labor class, needed a working class, but um, public education was also an instrument used to control the minds of folks. Still is, right? Oh, of course, of course. I'm going to tell you who you are to us in right. terms of um, <laughs> right, <laughs> yes. right. You, you, you're going to have a, you're going to make a whole little comedy about a school in Philadelphia that people kind of find funny, but then when there's a shooting. In Texas, we're going to ask you, could you do an episode do of an Abbott episode. Elementary on shooting? Why? Because you're black. I mean, I'm sure you've dealt with it. I mean, again, this is the whole thing. Who are they to us? 
Lord, <laughs> when I saw that, I just was like, the disrespect and the boldness. Exactly. But you just like, said it, Shayna. You just said it. Oh who are we? Who are we to you? Oh, you're, mm-hmm. you're people who kill each other. Are you offended? Why? Are you offended? Why are you your offended? objects for our entertainment, right? Like, no question. You're supposed to be dancing out here, monkey dance. Like that's dance, monkey, or uh, but, but all your children are always at risk. Again, I mean, a story we've talked about before. I remember maybe our third year of Freedom Schools, Philadelphia Freedom Schools, when we had all the young people together, maybe about 300 high school students, and they had some city council members there, and they were talking about metal detectors in the high schools. And I'll never forget this girl, the Freedom School scholar who was Chinese American, who goes to, went to girls' high. I say goes, it's been 20 years ago almost. The child said, I want, I want metal detectors in girls. What are you talking about? She said, until... My comrades here don't have to go through metal detectors. They should be in all the schools. What are you saying that Ben Franklin got them? William Penn got them. How come we don't have them? I want them. If they have them, I want them. And everybody started cheering. I never forget that. What, because, <laughs> no, because that, that, to your point, what is the assumption you make about our children? About our children. <laughs> what is the assumption you make about our children? And I, I have these this conversation about the assumption that people make about black children um, yes. in many spaces because. Yes. You know, for all of the, the hoopla that happens in our communities and all the violence that happens, right? Like, I don't walk into our communities necessarily and feel unsafe. I dang on sure don't walk into black schools or predominantly black schools and feel unsafe or feel like a mass murder is going to happen at, at any given time. No. But baby, when I tell you there are streets that I walk um, in <laughs> suburban areas, there, there are schools that I walk and people that I see um, that are, are white. And I'm just like, oh, I'm a little nervous, child. No question. Um because of the homegrown terror that has been allowed to, to happen here. And here's the thing, you know, black people can be painted as violent or whoever, but there's a history of violence and we learned it from someone. <laughs> okay. That's right. And I don't think that that's ever really pointed and talked about, um, you know, mass media gets their hands on certain things and they portray things in a certain way, but you know, that's propaganda. That's also a part of education and indoctrination in this country because you have to be, very critical of who owns those networks and how those stories get put out. That's right. Um, and, and how they get put out in, in certain ways. Meaning, That's right. black violence is always and white, widely publicized, right? And there's always a conversation about black on black violence um, in this country when it's like, it's violence. Meaning, people commit crimes to people that's closest to them. That's right. right? Like, that's just what happens. That's right. So if I'm in a neighborhood with black people, like, I'm going to do that. But you put a bunch of black people in the neighborhood and you put them on top of each other and you starve them and you don't give them no resources. I don't like what, what expectations did you think were going to come out of that? That's <laughs> you right. think people, I mean, you don't give them any resources to make, to cook, have their own food or things. Um, again, we just talked at the top of the show about it's purposely done, right? Not everybody's going to live out to their full potential. So you are purposely yeah. created to be a permanent underclass. But what do you expect to happen in communities where there aren't any resources? Right. You, you, um, you're you just going to die? Oh, well, I don't have anything. I guess I just sit here and starve. No, you're going to fight for survival. Exactly. You're going to get things the best way you know how. Exactly. Um, but and, again, you're, and in many spaces, your mind is also indoctrinated to tell you that you ain't ish. Right. Right. That all you're ever going to be is this. And, and that's, that's difficult, Shane, because what you're describing, of course, as we know, is the pervasive nature of violence. Everything yes. you just described is an act of violence. Yep. Cultural violence, educational violence, economic, it's all violence. Mental now, and spiritual violence, spiritual a- violence. Our people are killed spiritually. Absolutely. And what happens when you knock a man's spirit down? You can't, you can't, I mean, the, the, and this is, this is where, again, as we think about educators and, and the next generation of educators and looking back through time at educators who were the most successful, we have to ask ourselves the question you framed this whole discussion with. What is the purpose of education? And I'll tell you right now, we worked very hard and continue to work very hard with the concept of, of a freedom school notion. We are not going to develop curriculum, instruction, programming that is designed to uh, be a reaction to that violence because then what you end up doing is you have lowered the expectation of the children so that everything you do is designed to plea for your humanity with whiteness no so no. so our children rarely get a chance to ground themselves in themselves 
Now, a lot of times curriculum folk will say, well, that's what we're doing. No, that's not what you're doing. What you're doing is trying to come up with a, I'm a human, see, see, see. Mm -hmm. You have to reject that because that is the violence that perpetuates the initial violence. You don't have to explain your humanity. Ground these children in who they are. They have the, and so that's why, again, we can't have curriculum that starts with slavery. Well, see, we got the, we talk about slavery. That's not progress. All you're doing there is teaching children that you come from a people who have been taking ass whoopings. You were born into an ass whooping. And so, and then every little. Or like you chose to be a slave. Like, Not that. But even when people talk about slavery, yes. right? You know, slavery, black people were slaves. No, let's talk about how black people were kidnapped. Like, we need to start saying that. Can't, like, and yes. we need to say there was enslavement. Because when you use the word enslavement, they, there, somebody has to do the slaving, right? Like, That's right. Who, who That's put right. black people in slavery? That's right. Not like, yes, because during the times of slavery, like, we chose, right? right. Like, like, it was an era. Like, right. black people was choosing to be slaves back then. No, we were kidnapped. That's right. And it's not framed. Um, right. In that way. But again, education is indoctrination. No, when books were written by white people, they're not, <laughs> they call it slavery. They're not That's naming right. that it was oppressed. Okay. We're going to acknowledge this, acknowledge that this happened, but we're not going to acknowledge that this was done to black people. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And in fact, it's so funny you said it because in Philadelphia, of course, that is a prime place for perpetuating that lie narrative. Mm -hmm. Every July 4th, when they convene at the Constitution Center or before that was built over at Independence Hall, read that Declaration of Independence, perpetuate that violent narrative of erasure, you see it. And mm -hmm. I'll never forget several consecutive summers, freedom school students would go to the protests down there. Why? Because they were building what is now known as the President's House Interpretation Center. And the freedom school students knew what was going on and joined other black Philadelphians and others. It wasn't just black people to protest and say, no, you're not going to build this and lie on our people. And that's why today, if you ever go to the city of Philadelphia, those of you listening from around the world, you go down where Independence Hall is and you see the interpretation center in front of Independence Hall. That's why you have all those black people in there. That's why you have mm -hmm. uh, uh, Hercules. That's why you have on a judge. All that is because black people, including freedom school students, even some mm -hmm. of them, even as young as the scholars, not even the junior servant leaders, went down there and said, no, we resisted. Yes. We resisted. And you're not going to have tourists come here and think we just got beat up. <laughs> Hercules and Ona Judge escaped. They left and they, <laughs> they said, what? Mm -hmm. And they lived as free people. And then you're going to talk about Richard Allen. You're going to talk about, I mean, but that, but to, to what you're observing, that only happened because we pushed back. And that only yes. happened because they knew to push back and they had to, they were armed with the facts. And that only happens when you change the education system. That's right. When you indoctrinate people in the right way. That's exactly because right. education is indoctrination. But when you indoctrinate people the right way and you indoctrinate them with the truth. That's exactly right. With the truth. But as we see and we know, right, like. America don't want us to have the truth. Black people want some, and of course some white people because it doesn't feed the necessity of those little small portions at the top, right? And that's when we get to talking about capitalism. That's right. Oh, the people are loving this because all of this can be monetized. Every oh, last person. piece of it can be monetized. That's right. So whether it's black people killing each other, and I mean, this is going to sound so bad, but I need people to like to think about this in, in a certain way. When black people are killing each other, black folks don't have resources, right? Mm -hmm. They got to think about the things that then show up or come into the hood to offer you resources. And I'm not saying don't accept resources. I'm just saying be very critical and very knowledgeable about where it's coming from. So even like mental health is a major thing. Mental health is a huge thing in our communities. But be very careful about who's propagandering that, where that's being offered from. But we talking about mental health services, and I wish I knew the numbers on this, but how many black people don't even have access to insurance to go see somebody mm. in the community, right? So we can push them to off all we want, but how many of our folks don't even have access to a level of service to be able to go do that, right? Because they, they, they can't walk into a clinic or they just don't have the means to be able to do that. They don't have the money. No. You don't have the resources. That's right. So, so even talking about that kind of stuff. So when we're talking about really supporting and helping black people, give them resources. Um, well, I mean, we and, already and, know. Well, and also, we, again, this is where memory comes in. We ask ourselves a, a, a question. What were we doing before there were therapists? 
Um, if you if you ask me, only yeah. because of what what I've been in, yes. right? I've always been in the era of therapists, right? But I've also had the luxury of communing with black elders. Exactly. Um, so the fact that people also have this notion of like black people put this stigma on um, like therapy, maybe in the clinical sense, but. And it's this, again, this overarching uh, narrative that has taken place. So if you tell your family something, they'll tell you, oh, you you crazy or, you know what I mean? Like people reject this notion that people struggle mentally, like black people reject that notion. But that's to me, that's, that's never been true. Exactly. And, um, when, and when did it become a luxury? See, again, this is where, and again, thinking about education, when we start talking about education for our people, it has to be completely remade. And the things that we have built and maintained and passed on have to be recovered because Mm -hmm. they were never universal, but there was a time when they were much more predominant than they are today. Um, I was watching something, maybe it was a Math Hoffa podcast, you know, these brothers and sisters, mostly brothers, sitting in this fake barbershop, have conversation about hip hop, and Tretch was on there, of course, one Jer- Jersey's finest, right? These, he's sitting, <laughs> and they were talking about how they are too old now to be rapping about the stuff they was rapping about when they was teenagers and 20-somethings. So mm-hmm. Tretch, one of them said, well, we need some old man rap. <laughs> and it's, right! <laughs> and no, but the point I'm trying to raise is this. He, Tretch was talking about being now, He, I guess he's in his 50s, trying to talk to teenagers and he said I went into one place to talk about violence and trying to stop the violence and he said well we need you to talk to our old head and he said bros the old head was 16 and they was all like what and that's what led to the but the point I'm trying to make is that intergenerational uh uh, community that you're talking about where you could talk as a younger woman to older women or even older men this community Mm -hmm. it wasn't everywhere but it was most places that got disrupted. And now we've been shifted to this paradigm to say, well, we need to find therapists. We need to find counselors. Now, are there roles for those people? Absolutely. Absolutely. However, the revolutionary thing would be to reconstruct our communities. And you know as well as I do, all the years of freedom schools, one of the most important elements of our freedom school model is that parent space. When yeah. the parents meet during the week and when the parents, and then by the end of that space, you you're rebuilding community. Cause these people yeah. are now saying, okay, I'm I have a degree. Well, I don't have a degree. I went to school, okay, I had to drop out and go to work. But at this point, we all a bunch of 40-year-olds talking to each other. And then we brought grandma in and great and next thing you know, you didn't ask me for a piece of paper before I came in here. I am a parent. I am a yes. member of the community. So therefore, my authority, my experience is being honored in this space. And then people say, well, why can't school be like this? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Mm-hmm. Do not, don't shut parents out. Put parents at the center of the conversation. Yes, very much so. And Freedom Schools does that. It yes. just creates this connection, this community, again, amongst yes. folks. Um, yes. And without shame. With without the, shame. The, the opposite of shame. We honor people's learning because education yes. isn't as you say it isn't an institutional thing every human being learns from the moment almost I, I would say of conception the organism is learning how to survive by the time you come out of your mother's womb you've learned enough to be viable when you come out you're immediately learning yes. which is which is why now we're seeing studies that are beginning to emerge because of covid of how infants have been affected by the fact that many of the people they see don't have bottoms of their faces because babies learn Mm. how to read faces by reading faces. But now they got his eyes. (laughs) Unless they had to adapt to that. Um. When you ask yourself a basic question, when you take your baby out in public, if she's only used to seeing your face or her daddy face, and then you go out and everybody else got a face, she's not even learning how to make connections to other human beings. I mean, it's, it's crazy. We're always learning. <laughs> these babies are like, what in the alien is happening out here? Who are these people with no mouths? Shane, I'm, t- <laughs> Shane, I'm telling you, I haven't, I haven't read any of the studies. All I've read is a couple of abstracts, but that is exactly what they're asking. Is this going to impact them going down the road? Yeah, that's a, that's actually a really interesting take <laughs> yeah. on that. These poor babies, like, we Where's her mouth, Mom? Where's like. her mouth? <laughs> right. Right. And, and it, yeah. might, it, it, it might not even be articulated as a question like that. It might be because they're too young mm-hmm. to be able to say anything, but it has now been imprinted on them. On their minds. On their yes. minds. On Definitely. their minds. 
Yes, Doc, with all that's going on right now, I want to flip the script real quick. I mean, this is still connected to education, but this is how I kind of want to, you know, work this in. So we know um, in the past couple of weeks, there have been two publicized mass shootings, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but again, this isn't like this is what happens um, in America. But our poor um, folks up in Buffalo who, who lost their lives to a homegrown terrorist uh, and then those babies who lost their lives um, in Uvel to, again, yet another homegrown terrorist. Um, but, you know, we have children who are losing their lives every day in inner cities across America. Some you could consider to um, homegrown terrorists, others you consider to people just literally trying to survive. Um, but while all of this is happening, there's just these crazy debates to me that are coming up about gun control. Um, and when folks are talking about gun control, they begin to talk about the Second Amendment. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I went and I remember learning about the Second Amendment, right? Like, this is crazy, right? I think I learned about the Second Amendment probably second, third grade. Mm-hmm. Um, we start talking about the Constitution. You start talking about the Bill of Rights. You start talking about, like, all of that is wrapped into the Boston Tea Party and, you know, us, you know... The Virgin from England and, and becoming our own and like we have rights. So even when you think about the premise of why all of this happened, right? Like there was we were under control of another country and had to establish ourselves. Meaning like, yes. yep, we do have the right to bear arms because we have to have a communal militia. Meaning when you come for me, right, as another entity, we have to be ready to fight. So we have to have the opportunity to have guns to defend our community. Yes. Not like my property, per se. Like, this is mine. If you come over here, I'm going to shoot you. It's like we have to be ready because, again, back then it wasn't no army. Like, you had regular moms, dads, brothers. Sisters. Like, we strapping up and we going to war with these people because this is our land. And we no longer have to live under their rule. You know what I'm saying? And That's another right. one another another continent or whatever the case may be like all of that was like dated for those purposes but the way that i see people literally like and i'm gonna use this like prostituting the second amendment it's insane to me that's right uh and all in the name again of gun control like you could have innocent people who just go on grocery shopping on a regular day and babies babies how many times in this country babies like these people with babies lose their lives and I think about it as a parent like my child's five or six I, like you wake your child up you get them dressed in the morning lay their little clothes out you feed them breakfast you put them in the car or you walk them to school or whatever and you, you kiss your baby because you know okay I'm gonna see you later and as a parent I don't have any anxiety right like my kids in school like I, I'm at I can go to work because imagine being a parent living in constant fear anxiety about what's going on you couldn't work that's right you couldn't live with like where am I gonna put my child you couldn't live with yourself right like that's right you go and you put them somewhere that you think that they're going to be safe. Like one of the safest places, I would say to most in parents' minds, right? I got to be able to send my kid to school and not worry about if they're going to come home. That's right. But you at work, you know, you think, well, okay, what I'm going to cook for dinner or what I'm going to get a little boo-boo after school. We're going <laughs> to do like these are all the things you're thinking. That's right. And and to get a call that you, your child ain't never coming home. <laughs> nah. I mean, you're never going to see your baby again. Nah. It's insane. But people want to argue about gun control. And prostitute <laughs> the Second Amendment. That's right. And I'm even putting this in the context of like parents and kids, but these teachers who are up against enough. Like I'm up against enough already with whatever community I'm in, with the level and the state of education and politics happening. And some of them, like, all I want to do is teach. Want to teach. That's it. So I'm up against all of this. Now you're telling me. Somebody's telling me they're not going to ban, like, <laughs> assault rifles. Oh, but then you want to have a conversation about arming me with a gun. Um, but I don't have a say-so in the curriculum I teach, right? Because at the same time, you want, me, you want to fight with me about CRT. Like, I can't teach what I want to teach. But That's right. But I got to be trained on how to shoot and kill somebody as, <laughs> as a part of my job, right? But yeah. I, I'm not competent but, enough to pick curriculum that I want to teach children. That's right. Well, they don't but mean I'm, that. They don't mean that. So tell that. me what they mean. Then. They mean we need to stay in elected office so we continue to steal. You said mm-hmm. the magic words, capitalism. Ted Cruz, who is a magnificent punk, uh, <laughs> you know, as the great uh, Tariq Trotter, black thought of the roots would say, first yeah. ones to fall is cats with no chin. So anyway, Ted Cruz, 
they they all seem to have a chin deficiency, but I won't go into Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz. I mean, growing a beard doesn't help you, you chinless punk. But Definitely. he doesn't he doesn't want to arm teachers. He wants to remain the senator from Texas so that he can continue to steal tax breaks and this kind of thing. So it sounds good, but they would never arm teachers. Now, if Irma Garcia had had a gun in that classroom and Uval, mm -hmm. I suspect that she would have taken the guy out. Because remember, Irma Garcia is the one of the teachers that was killed, who when she mm -hmm. was found was cradling a child that she had tried to protect with her body who also died. And of course, Irma Garcia's husband, Joe, is the brother who the next day had a heart attack heart and died. Attack. And his yeah. family was like, he died of a broken heart. So I, I would trust Irma Garcia before any of the punk ass cops who didn't have any children, those Spanish speaking children in the, in the school, because if their child had been in the school, they wouldn't have hid like the punk cowards they are in the building as that baby called 911 over and over again. Because if that had been their little girl in there, they would have gone in and killed that man. So shout out to all the punk ass cops, because, see, there's only two ways that this is going to play out, because this isn't a nation. We need to get that straight. A nation is a concept that speaks uh, to the notion of a collective identity. There is no collective identity because if those, if the biological children of those cops who were pushing around the parents outside the school, if their biological children had been in the building, they would have gone in. But they weren't mm -hmm. their children, just like the policymaker I mentioned earlier from Philadelphia. These are other people's children. So there's no nation. Let's just be very clear about that. There is no one people. There's no such thing as the American people. A lot of different people live here. But I said all that to say this, these politicians don't want to arm teachers. They want to win elections by getting people to look for an excuse to continue to vote for them. Um, the Second Amendment does not support any of this. It doesn't support 18 year olds buying AK weapons. Mm -hmm. It doesn't support arming teachers. It doesn't support arming people. The Second Amendment is very short. It says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It was written at a time when state, when there was no standing army in the United States. Mm -hmm. State militia meant what now is the state police or the National Guard. In other words, who are the people who protect as their job the state? Exactly. This has been, and I'll never forget Chief Justice Berger. It's a very famous uh, clip of Warren Berger, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, in an interview where he said, this is a completely made up right. It is not in the Constitution. This is judge made law. They have interpreted it. And, and prior to the end of the Civil War, with the Dred Scott decision and others, it was interpreted basically to say, if you are white, you can get a gun. Why? Because we need all the white people in the country basically to be deputy police to keep these black people from escaping. Because we know policing in the South of the United States came out the slave patrols. Mm -hmm. This is what. Now, in the modern era, two things have happened. Courts have interpreted this to mean that individuals have a right to bear arms. That's not what the, the amendment says. It has been interpreted to mean that. The second thing is, if you live in a state or a polity, like the District of Columbia, for example, where a law was passed to deny people the right to just go out and buy a gun. In 2008, the Supreme Court ruled in D.C. versus Heller that the Washington, D.C. ban on handguns was unconstitutional. In other words, these people just make the law up. Now, how does that relate to education? Somewhere there's a child who wants to be a Supreme Court justice. Guess what? You keep studying. You keep busting your tail because if you make it one day and there's enough of you on the court, you can reinterpret the Second Amendment. This, mm -hmm. is why, this is why education is so important. We have to have a different vision, but it doesn't come from conforming to the way we've been socialized. We've been socialized to believe that judges are, are basically just upholding the Constitution. That is a lie. Any first year law student to tell you that. And the Second Amendment is great evidence of it. Facts. Listen, I love that. And shout out to the young people or the young people's parents uh, who are listening out there today. <laughs> Tell these babies keep studying. Yes. Tell these babies keep studying. And, and really studying. So when they come to you with some old BS, you really don't need to learn math, but make up this rhyme so that you can. No, I don't want no damn rhymes. <laughs> I want the numbers. 
<laughs> you understand? Oh, no, no, you don't have to work that hard. We'll make up a game. I don't want no damn game. <laughs> Give me the book. <laughs> oh, we'll have a computer program where you can try 15 times. No, I don't want no damn computer. Give me the stuff that's going to make sure that when I am an adult and in the position to intervene, I don't have to rely on a computer program or I don't even know enough. No, studying is slow, accretive work. Everything, mm-hmm. not a game. This is one of my, this is, we can't make it, or better yet, make everything a game. See where that gets you. You know what you'll be doing? Playing games. Playing games. <laughs> I was just going to say, playing games. Right. For the rest of your life. For the rest of your life. Meanwhile, the children of the people who made the game aren't even allowed computers until a certain age. Yes. <laughs> but again, people have to see that. Mm-hmm. Um, people have to see that. And people have to understand that. Um, That's right. And they, That's there right. are reasons why we would spoon fed certain things um, or we get an easy way out on certain things. That's right. Um, but that's why I wanted to harp on this point or highlight this point, so to speak, about the Second Amendment. Um, because, again, if you don't remember second grade um, <laughs> or you don't brush up on that or you, you weren't paying attention, whatever the case may be, people will have you out here thinking because they will quote the Second Amendment. I mean, prostituted to death yeah. about death. We have a right to bear arms. No, 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 no. Stop no. it. Stop it. Stop it. Quote, quote whatever state law gave you the right to bear arms or protect your home. Don't quote the Second Amendment because Don't. that's not. <laughs> and, and, and even if you even if you say, OK, militia mean everybody. Yeah. Fine. Did you miss those first two words in front of uh, militia? It said, well, regulated. Regulated. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't we, have we, it. We're not here reckless. No. Exactly. We're not here reckless. Exactly. It's right there in the document. Come on now. Yes. <laughs> we not out here reckless. Right. But that's one of the ones that I'm like, yo, if you go back and read it, it's very clear. Very clear. Very clear. Because I'm like, maybe I missed something, but I remember. Nah, nah. Then they're like, no, it's actually super clear on nah. what is meant. Nah. Even when you think about interpretation, I'm like, you really can't interpret this another way. Like, it's super clear um, on what is meant. Um, by the Second Amendment. That's but right. That's right. And we have to be very clear. careful because I remember in eighth grade when I was in, in, in Nashville, I had a teacher, Milton Kennerly. He had something called like the Law and Justice uh, Small Learning. Well, we call them small learning communities now, I guess, that mm-hmm. we used to. And just that simple introduction to Miranda warnings or, you know, I mean, you got a bunch of eighth grade black kids in the South who are introduced to the power of language. And we all have had that teacher who yeah. introduced us to the power of language. A lot of our young people, and we've seen it all the time, Shane, we see, you know, a lot of our young people want to be lawyers. Why? <laughs> because they figure, okay, if I can master this language, I can free our people. I'm yes. not, Malcolm X wanted to be a lawyer. Mumia talked about being, everybody want to be a lawyer. Sharif, Sharif el Mecki wanted to be a lawyer. Sharif el Mecki. this is what I'm saying. Why are we drawn to the law? Because it is our natural proclivity to want to acquire intellectual mastery in service of our liberation. There's a Correct. reason our people. So if our young people present themselves wanting that, it is our obligation to give them the best training. And it isn't just about what form to fill out. It isn't just about understanding bail. No, it's about understanding the underlying principles of law. And those principles are not to be found in Europe. That's why we started Africa. <laughs> so yes. that's what we can give our children. And it, not just encourage them, instruct them. Encouragement. Yes. People say, oh, we have a curriculum that's going to make them feel good about themselves. I don't want that curriculum. I want the curriculum and instruction. Because guess what? Self-esteem will come as a byproduct of instruction. But if you just got a self-esteem curriculum, you should go back over there with somebody else. Because that's not and helping our children. I talk to people about that a lot. And, yes. and understanding, like, when they're like, well, where does... Especially, when, you know, when they talk about freedom schools. Mm-hmm. And they talk about the black pride. Like, this black pride that you guys have. Or, you know, this is really a... You know, you have to use those buzzwords like this culturally relevant um, pedagogy here that you guys are teaching. Mm-hmm. And now nah, we just truth teaching. Exactly. Go, you're not going to go nowhere else where these kids are going to have all black people that they learn about for five straight weeks. All black characters that they actually get to see themselves in something and all black people teaching and telling them. About. You're not going to get that anywhere else. And, and principles and intellectual work that when they leave there, the, the light bulb goes on. And they say. I never had to do this quality of intellectual work. What and I like you, it. And I like it because... And I like it. Look, it's so funny. I'm, I'm interviewing a, a lady in a couple of days for the, the, the thing I do on Black Star Network. You mentioned the Black Table. Natasha um, Wariku. She wrote a book called Race at the Top. It's very interesting. She is Indian American. She's at Tufts University. She studied a school district 
in a rich community where the white parents, very liberal, they're very proud of having some black students and brown students from the neighboring uh, school district they bring in. But the district they're in has moved from about 15 percent non-white to about 40 percent Asian American. The Asian American students are killing them in the classroom. Test mm-hmm. scores are, are higher. Out of it, and the white parents are complaining because what they're saying is, "Wait, we need to get an advantage for our children." And then the, the Asian parents are like, "Wait, what, what do you mean? You told us test scores, right?" And the white parents say, "Yes." So here's where it is, Shane. This is for fascinating. The Asian American parents do things like, "Okay, nights and weekends, we got our own." Independent stuff where you learn more math, you learn more language, <laughs> you learn, and then the white parents don't want to do that. So what have the white parents begun to do? They begun to lobby the school district to say we should give more weight to extracurricular activities and athletics because the goal isn't top quality education. The goal is to keep their children at the top. But the Asian parents said, I thought it was academic achievement. They said yes, but we don't want our children in the weekend school. And the Asian American parents are like. But you could put your children. No. And so I can't wait to talk to Professor Riku because, again, but here's here's the kicker. This is what she said. But this is what blew my mind. This is why I wanted to talk to her. She said, as I'm sitting interviewing these white parents and they're telling me about their complaints. These are white parents who think they're very liberal because they have a few black students and brown students. She said, I'm sitting there thinking to myself as an Indian, as the child of Indian immigrants from the Indian subcontinent, she says, Hmm, should I be? Ha- should I have my students, my children, in the weekend school? In other words, she's torn because she too is Asian American. So she's saying. And the other thing, and this is where this is where it really kicked me. And I said, "Oh my God!" She said, "But what they all don't realize, none of these parents, is that every one of those children is going to get the reward of high quality education. And the real students who are suffering." are all the students who are not in that school district, the Mm -hmm. ones you were talking about at the beginning of the show. She said, this is a battle between people. That's why she calls it race at the top and not race to the top. top. They already at the top. These these are the haves. These are the haves. These are the haves. Arguing with each other. And Shana, I promise you, I know we don't have an answer yet because we know we don't have an answer. How do we figure out how a place like Freedom School or any place else makes sure that our children aren't trying to race to the top uh, or grounded in the way <laughs> so that we just do what we need to do. Cause you, what she's showing is you can't get there. That top is there. Well, doc, that's <laughs> such a tough question, right? I and know the reason. And the reason why it's a tough question and it ties, this is a, this is probably gonna have to be another show in a longer conversation. And I'm gonna t- try to articulate this thought as best as possible as I can. So when you think about Africans in America, uh, but Africans who have been through American enslavement, right? And I have to make that distinction because the distinction because there are tons of Africans in America, right? That's right. From all over the di- diaspora, um, there are Africans whose ancestors have been enslaved, but possibly on the continent of Africa, right? Mm-hmm. But not necessarily here in America. Mm-hmm. So when you're talking about the Africans whose ancestors have been enslaved, who are descendants of the enslavement of Americans, right? Yes. We're almost the only culture where folks can infiltrate us um appropriate us Mm. and it goes without question (laughs) so what i'm saying to that is if you are dealing with asian americans or indian americans right generally they move into communities that are populated with mostly their culture right Yes. You get a few, but mostly they move into areas, even when they come to America, that's populated by them. Then you look at the schools they go to, they build their own schools, right? So you have their schools where their language is primary, American language is secondary. Mm-hmm. Or, 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 or they supplement the schools that they go into, which is what Riku is writing about. These parents didn't stop their children from going to these well-funded schools. What they did was build the other educational spaces on nights and weekends right so that's exactly going to right. say that but that's because exactly. they're a community and they're together right like that's right hey this is what we're going to do that's and right. ain't they got to own like we're going to so-and-so's house or we're going to be at our church and we're going to do this because there's so much in community that's with right. each other that's right what has happened to africans who have been through american enslavement we've been taught again indoctrinated 
that like we're not in community with each other. Like you're individual and you're American, right? Like, and that's just who you are. Like we're not our own subset of a, a cultural community. Meaning, if I was Nigerian, right? Um, I would be with my Nigerian folks, right? Like nobody mm-hmm. would question that. Wouldn't be any infiltration in that. That's just a community and a culture that I'm I'm in the midst of. At least at least for a couple of generations. Because what John Ogbu and, would, and many others would show is that when an immigrant community comes to the United States, it tends to diminish over time. So within, within several generations, you may end up with uh, a like, uh, what's the sister was on um, Insecure? Yvonne uh, Orgy? Orgy, yeah. Yeah. Her, her mother, of course, her parents are Nigerian. Her mother worked at Howard University Hospital for many years. She has the imprint as she works in her comedy routine of that kind of discipline. But her child will not have that same. They'll have an echo or bam, or bam out of bio. I mean, in other words, yes. it takes you, you know, Joel Embiid got it. Joel Embiid's grandkids It's going to over time begin to. But for the African in the United States, we had something not the same, but similar in the sense that that communal thrust survived enslavement. and cra- It was created in enslavement and preserved during apartheid, what we call Jim Crow. Only after the end of legal segregation did you see that beginning of fracture. And a lot of that was because of public policy making by non-black people. Yes. And the, the point I'm trying to connect is you will continue to see, even though Joe and Bill's grandkid, Joe, Joel and B's grandkids or Giovanni jo, um, or these grandkids may see a different world, not as pieced together and communal as like living together and communing together. They will still have that culture to connect to. No right? question. No question. Meaning no question. Africans enslaved in, in America. Like Absolutely. I was having this conversation with my sister the other day. Absolutely. We we're talking about how when we get together as a group. So let's talk about freedom schools, right? Mm-hmm. How we get together and we talk about something as simple as Harambe, right? Yes. Just that simple. We we'll get together. We will do Harambe and the many co- components of Harambe beyond cheering and chanting, right? Pouring libations, giving thanks to ancestors or just feeling good about being in community together. Which, are, like, which are Philadelphia Freedom Schools innovation in the Freedom School career. They do not pour libation in the Children's Defense Fund. For, that's a Philadelphia mm-hmm. Freedom School. And, and, and then it caught fire and now everybody doing it. But, that's and, that's, and that's also the gift of people like uh, Baba El Meki's mother. In other words, that that innovation in free, Philadelphia Freedom Schools was a direct gift of the African Center Independent Schools in the 1960s and 70s. We said we can't do it otherwise. That's right. Yes. But calling <laughs> upon our ancestors. That's right. That's even right. if you took a took a libation out, but the practice of what Harambe is, right? That's right. That's right. Point I'm making is nobody will ever go into a Chinese American space where they do their rituals, right? No white people will go into that and say like, let me join that. Can we replicate that um, in our public schools to have that happen? Mm-hmm. Like, what's what's the words you guys are saying? Let let us <laughs> let us join in that. Let us join in that. Well, well, they don't have to because it's called the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Because it's called Flag Day and Constitution Day and the mm-hmm. federal holidays. In other words, what what whiteness, the power of whiteness is in its invisibility. Harambe is every day. White Harambe is what they call the education system. That's white Harambe. But yes, and the point I'm connecting is that they will have white Harambe, but then try to take the culture of black enslaved no Africans question. No question. and sprinkle it in there. You would never do that with any other culture. That's right? right. You just wouldn't appropriate it massively That's and right. widely to say, we got to figure out how to connect to these black children. No. Like, and like, we're going to, you know what I mean? Take but, that appropriate uh, and sprinkle it around. And, and, and they would and disrespect do, it at but, that. As long as it doesn't mess up the framework, they don't mind dropping a few black and brown faces in there, like like Professor Riku was talking about. But here's where I know we failed in Philadelphia Freedom Schools, but I know that failure is probably what's going to happen until we succeed. When mm-hmm. we wrote that Pathways curriculum, we realized you can't compromise. In other words, Harambe is the ritual, and it, and it kind of inculcates values, this kind of thing. But you can't, we're not going to talk about literacy. We're not going to talk about numeracy. We're not going to say anything that is close enough for them to continue to populate with an intellectual genealogy that educates our children in them being inferior, that has Mm -hmm. them looking for a Benjamin Banneker or an Elijah McCoy. That has, no. We invented 
math. So therefore, this is a pathway to Shashet. We're not going to just call the ancestor. We're going to put her at the foundation of everything that can be measured and counted. So mm -hmm. you're not going to just be looking for a black astronomer in their narrative. You're going to say, we created astronomy. If you want to yes. write... We're not going to look for Toni Morrison or James Baldwin. We're going to have a pathway to Jehudi and Jehudi is Sashet's sister. Now, we know that was going to fail. Why? It is so alien mm -hmm. to the enslaved mind that it sounds crazy. And so when you talk about the Nigerians or the Koreans or the Chinese, it's not foreign because it is literally in the practices of the generation that came exactly. here. But for the enslaved African, the commitment was to erase all of all that of memory. That. So our fight Thanks. back was, we're not going to fight you by coming up with black versions of your genealogy. We're going to break the chain that has our children learning who they are through your ancestors and link them to their ancestors. Mm -hmm. And we, we knew that was going to fail because it is so foreign that it does two things. Number one, it's unrecognizable until you grasp it, which is why you almost have to start with the children. But the second thing is even more dangerous people are terrified of it. Yes. So they're so terrified that even educational policymakers to say, we're with you, don't think they can do it. So therefore, nope. they just say, well, we'll put an ankh over here. We'll put a little Egyptian. No, this is intellectual warfare. Nah, I, we can't. Well, who, who are we going to find? You see that? This is the slave in you saying, we can't win. We can't win. <laughs> we can't yes. win. We can't win. <laughs> yeah. Yes, like I said, that this we'll get into like that's a whole nother episode. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But it stretches into it brings us all the way back to full circle about how education is most definitely indoctrination. And to me it also absolutely. ties back into like this is why we need black teachers. Um because and not, thought, and not just black teachers, we need black teachers who are trained well. Yes, who are indoctrinated the right way. <laughs> yes. Indoctrinated and, the right way. And the reason why I say that, even for the visual eye, like I can't imagine going to a school with all black children and see a bunch of white women leading them in Harambe. Like, I just think I would die. But it's probably happening somewhere. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I'm going to say less because uh, it's happening in freedom schools around the country. But anyway, oh I'm going uh, to... And, and it's called <laughs> progress. <laughs> anyway. Oh, no. But, no. but would, you, would you rather have that or no Harambe? I would rather have... If those are the only two choices. Don't do that to me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because because this is the other thing. This is why building that educator pipeline is so important. People I would want my kids to have Harambe. I would. But at the same right. I would. It's right. important. It's important. Right. As long as they're understanding what it is and learning it the right way, I would want them to, to have that. Well, th this is why, as well as, you know, as we're building this thing you mentioned earlier with narrative and the social dimension of it, Nubia. Matt, we just finished reading Martin Delaney's Blake last night. We're doing Octavia Butler for the next month on Monday nights in Nubia. We have about 1,200 people who come together on these books and read them. I mean, it's really something. But this is why we have to now seize what has happened during COVID and use the technology. Because a lot of people will say, well, we don't have the teachers to do what you're talking about. All right, then well, we need to have you linked up to the satellite or whatever we're doing so we can broadcast this global Harambe then. In other words, mm -hmm. we have to come up with innovative ways to supplement what's going on in places where people say, well, we don't have the people. Well, we have the resources and the people. We can reach you until you can create a critical mass. Nobody should be disconnected. Agreed. If you don't have a black teacher where you're out where you are, then you need to connect to the center. And we figure out with the technology how to make sure that there are some black faces in that child's experience until you can get some living black teachers in the space. Agree. I yeah. agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah, yeah we and can do that's, that. That's why this mission has to be this mission. Meaning you're right. I wouldn't want the children to be without it. Right. Right. But I will also hope that the people in that space are conscious enough to say, like, I should not be doing this. So I also have to make it my life's work to make sure that it is people in a space that should be leading these activities. That's right. With these with these shit. Like if you really want to be an ally, you will understand the nature of that. You understand you don't need to be out front. Nope. Um, you shouldn't be out front. And the, and the last point I'll make is if you're thinking about pouring libations, um, the other thing that I generally say to people. Ooh. We don't want your ancestors mixing with ours, and that and you have to think about that. So don't Ooh. don't be calling out your folks' names. That's tough. Uh, when our no, it's not tough. It's for real. No, the reason I because. say that, <laughs> when I when I say it's tough, I don't mean don't do it. I mean, I, I remember I mean, this is many years ago. I was in Indianapolis at Madam C J Walker Theater, which they've now turned into a. I think uh, Mike Epps did his Netflix special from there. I just I laughed when I saw it. 
we had a ceremony there for the Indianapolis Public Schools. I was doing some work with them on their African-centered curriculum. And this brother got up, kind of African. He's pouring libation. He's calling names. Then he called John F. Kennedy. Whoa, no. <laughs> no, see that the face you made? All the black people in the audience was like, oh, you, you know, it's so funny. When you pour libation, oftentimes in many rituals, when you call a particularly powerful ancestor, Everybody, like, you'll say, yow, yow, or ashe, ashe. And then you'll call a powerful ass and everybody's like, whoa. It'll go down like that. <laughs> Almost like when somebody dunk on somebody, you be like, oh. Yeah. It's like, that, that survived us as Africans. We don't say, yeah. We'll be like, oh. Ooh. But when they pulled, we said, John F. Kennedy, everybody was like, oh. <laughs> but it was a different. <laughs> it was a different thing. Was different. Like, <laughs> why would you, don't call that man in this circle. What are you doing? <laughs> My ancestors are at peace and at power. You cannot mix the, like. They got to come back in death and be come on, <laughs> haunted man. by this. In CJ okay. Walker's, you in Madam Walker's house. And was, yeah. She built this building that you call. Come and on, And that's bro. what we call it. We're not calling on these people. No, but, no, but, no. But, no. but Shane, this, actually, this raised something very important. You, in terms of culture, this shows us that, yes, enslavement attacked us. But even continental Africans who don't have an understanding of the cultural unities in Africa and mm -hmm. among Africans who would say, see you black Americans, that's cultural appropriation. No, you think your culture is just Yoruba culture. Yes. And so you think it's, you don't, you don't even know what you did when you called John F. Kennedy. That's because you're not looking at yourself as an African. African. You're looking at yourself as a Nigerian, Nigerian. who's Yoruba. Yeah. And that's why people say y'all are cultural appropriation. No. Pan-Africanism was born in the diaspora. It wasn't even born on the continent of Africa. Nope. So, so we need to squash these diaspora wars. Yeah, we can have fun. Who got the best jollof rice? And uh, that's all great fun. <laughs> that's great. But but never forget, the only Africa we have is the one we make. Mm -hmm. So don't turn on each other because when it comes to fighting, ask those students from Ukraine that Hampton University said they'll pay full scholarship but you got black kids in Hampton that can't make their tuition payments. Whiteness forms together. Yes. No matter where they, you at. No matter where they at. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No matter where you at. So yes. at least, at least, at least take that lesson from your former master. Don't turn on yourself. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Don't turn on your folks. Don't turn on your folks. <laughs> yes. Doc, and I want to shout out everybody who celebrated African Liberation Day. Absolutely. Uh, May 25th. Absolutely. While we're having this conversation. And, Definitely and, shout and out to all of you. And never forget that George Floyd went to his ancestors on, on African, African Liberation, Liberation Day. Day. That's exactly right. And, though, and in fact, the day of his funeral in Houston, the, the collective in Ghana unveiled his face next to Breonna Taylor and them on the wall of ancestors in Accra. So that's mm -hmm. a, I'm glad you mentioned that, Shannon, because George Floyd's death isn't just an American phenomenon. The world organized, and we can't forget that two years ago this time, we were all in the street, and we, we need that same energy now. Yes. Energy should never die. No but question. That's why memory is important. No memory question. Memory is important. No question. But, Doc, we got to wrap. So I yes. want to send a shout out to everybody who is out there watching. Again, this has been another bomb episode with Baba Dr. Carr of mm. Building the Black Educator Pipeline podcast. Please remember to tell a friend to tell a friend. Subscribe. Make sure you drop a comment, a review. That's all right. that.